Hallo und herzlich willkommen zu einem weiteren Video auf diesem immer leer seienden Minecraft-Server. Äh, es ist eigentlich basically Singleplayer, was ich hier spiele. Ähm, falls ihr mit mir spielen wollt, Singleplayer together, äh, dann kommt doch auf 149.202.127.134 und wir schauen mal wieder ein Aaron Jones Video, äh, das es wieder auf zwei Stunden hier gestreckt hat. Wo bin ich denn gerade hier? Ähm, sollte ich das überhaupt abbauen? Ja. Äh, genau. Und ähm, auf dem Channel, auf dem YouTube-Channel Brian Clough, Link ist natürlich wie immer in der Beschreibung. Ähm, das Video mit dem Titel Aaron Jones Security Operational Security and Data Gathering. Dann würde ich sagen, let's get started. Genau. So, we're going to start with a real quick interview. I know that most of you are here because we want to talk about operational security. Das ist auch noch eine Domain, äh, unter der ihr diesen Server hier erreichen könnt. Okay, passt ein Bug in dem Video, oder? Ich bin gerade auf meinem Laptop die FPS so auf Null gedroppt. Big deal, real big deal right now. And if you are in the community in terms of uh, sitting around talking to people who are actually dealing with some of this stuff, this is a very, very big deal. Let's go over some of the numbers. At least 300,000 machines compromised, minimum, right now, okay? It only took a few hours for developers to look at this code after it was released into the wild and immediately start making uh, variants. So they took what was released, saw it, saw how effective it was, and said, hey, this is an awesome thing. We can use this to make it even worse. Hmm. And they immediately started improving the code. Uh, if you are curious, uh, you can actually go to the link that's on my page, and it will take you, I archive pretty much everything. Uh, so if you notice that it sends you to archive.is, this is just an archival web page. Anything that we discuss here, it doesn't get lost in the sands of time, that's all. So don't think that this is strange. It just so happens I'm just using this for this. This is the actual Microsoft Security Bulletin that discusses WannaCry. So if you want a sort of a breakdown of what Microsoft is saying, you can go here and see this, okay? In addition to that, there's already a GitHub set up with individuals going in there and deconstructing the code themselves. So you can actually follow along and see as they work on this and see how it was developed. Uh, they do a very, very detailed breakdown. Uh, one of my favorite parts here is if you get down here, uh, it is listed as not exploited and not publicly disclosed, so that's super cool. This is Whoa, Dave. He is trying to learn to Language the traditional way, oder wie ging das? <lacht> Leute, Dave, heute nicht. Ähm, wisst Bescheid. And then of course Werbung läuft nicht right unter Creative uh, Commons License, soweit ich weiß. And this was done by Zero Sum, and they discussed the double pulsar, as well as all of the shellcode and a absolute total breakdown of exactly how this thing works. You can go through here and see as they reverse engineer the code, you can see all of the calls, you can see how all of the code is managed. It is absolutely fascinating. But I wrote up just a quick little breakdown. So Microsoft had an exploit in SMB, which is file sharing protocol. That exploit has been available since 1.0 of SMB, okay? SMB 1.0. The individuals here actually wrote code that is able to discover whether or not your computer is x86 or x64. It then goes in and locates the MZ header in DOS. And then it starts allocating memory. And really what it's doing is it's sending malformed packets to the computer. Now they are good packets. The computer is able to interpret these packets, but they're malformed. And Essentially what that's doing is it's creating a space on the computer where you can execute from memory. Then they find the SMB drive. And 
by sending these packets, they're able to allocate memory and then copy code into the system, okay? And they create a backdoor. Now, there's a major flaw in the way this backdoor works. Because once you create this backdoor, anybody can use it. You opened up a huge hole in the computer that anybody can go through and you have no control over it. Now, for those of you who have any experience with malware or have any experience with actually executing attacks or any kind of penetration testing, if you create a door into a system, you want that to be your door. You don't want other people coming through that door. So that's the main flaw here. Is once you create that door, everybody who is looking for this vulnerability automatically is able to send code directly to this computer. That's a big issue. For those of you who remember malware sort of back in the you know late 90s, early 2000s, what was the first thing most people installed on the computer that they infected with malware. Anybody know? No? Antivirus. <laughs> True story. You break into a computer, and the first thing you do is you add antivirus, and you add all of the tools necessary to make that foothold yours and yours alone. That's the flaw right Geil. here. It's not your foothold. So once you've nice. done all of this, the system then starts accepting knocks. Everybody familiar with port knocking? Set a port up, and then you can knock that port by sending like two requests to a single port, and then two requests to another port, and then when you're finally ready for that fourth port, your SSH is open because the system is actually sitting there looking for these um, requests. Very similar idea here. Uh, you can send increments of uh, 4,096 bytes to the system. Leute, was ist denn da los? Ist das das Video? And doing so, you're able to craft a shell code payload and then send it to the system and have the system actually not only decrypt that shell code, but then run it. Which is a big deal. It's a very big deal. That is a that is an amazing thing to get a piece of software to do. Using what amounts to a buffer overflow in memory, you're able to get this thing to not only spit out errors, but to accept code and then deconstruct that code in that very limited space, and then eventually execute it. This is very fancy stuff, is the best way to put it. Uh, I would like to warn everybody that it's gonna get worse. Okay. At this level, now that we're starting to see this stuff, there are people who are already deconstructing this code and seeing how it can apply elsewhere. Okay? They're not just looking at this code and saying, well, Microsoft patched it. Uh, oh well. I guess we missed our chance. They're seeing how this code was crafted and how it functions, and they're already starting to mutate it so it will work elsewhere. Uh, and again, it's all being done on GitHub, and they're, they're sending information out. Uh, but in addition to that, don't remember, don't forget, I'm sorry, don't forget the attack that happens in the NSA with all of their information being leaked out. That's not done being leaked, okay? That's not finished. We're nowhere near done with that, so there's still more stuff on the way. Boah, uh, ich pack das gar nicht. Everybody das knows that Mike... Sieben Minuten dran. Ich oh. das Video ruckelt so hart, das ist ja gruselig. Ich würde gerne wissen, ob das das Video ist. Oder ich.
under Linux, so we're not we're not immortal just because we put on the Linux code, okay? So now that we've got our initial scary thing out of the way, let's get into our performance objective. So at the conclusion of the course, and for those of you who are not familiar with the way that these little talks work, I actually teach them like a general instructor would. So you're getting essentially the exact same education you would get if you were military or if you were police or anything else. If you were sitting in my classroom and we were all sitting around a table, this is the exact format that you would get. You get your performance objectives, we break everything down, and then at the end we actually discuss all of the performance objectives. Anybody else get it? I did. One other person? Well, you asked first, so go ahead. That's it. So you're not going to drink it? Okay. Well, you won. Enjoy your Mountain Dew right there. So we have a winner, and we have passed out our Mountain Dew. So. <laughs> Essentially, all I did was I created two images so that you can diff the two images and see that even though they look exactly the same, there is excess content, uh, what makes up steganography in a second image, and then from there you could actually even vim the image. And we'll go over all of this here shortly, but you could see that excess data, and it was just base, encode, base 64 encoded string at the bottom. You decode the string, and then it would just give you instructions. But we'll talk about the act of steganography how you can hide data inside of other data. All of that is part of it. But thank you very much. So we're going to identify what PGP is. We're going to identify the use of a PGP public key. We're going to identify the use of a PGP private key. We're going to understand a little bit better what encryption is. We're going to understand when to sign communication. And we're going to understand what threats prey on trust issues. We're going to be going over a lot of information, and this isn't all of it, but it is a part of it. So, normally, we talk about privacy. Right? Privacy is a big deal. We all want to be very private in our lives. Stay out of my information. You know, we don't want people reading our text messages. We don't want people going through any of our uh, phone calls. We don't want people rummaging through our mail. We don't want any of that stuff, right? We want our own autonomy. However, that is not always the greatest concern. Sometimes we need to actually be able to prove who we are. We can't just hide. We need to also be able to demonstrate that I am who I claim to be. Um, has anybody here ever received, and I know this is probably very rare, but have you ever received a phone call from a gentleman or young lady claiming to be from Microsoft letting you know that your computer is infected. Ah, so they said they're from Windows. Some of them said they're from Microsoft. So that must be them, right? For sure. It's gotta be. They got your phone number, right? Seems legit. Why would why would Bill Gates go to somebody and say, hey, call them and let them know we need to make them safe? He's a great guy. He would do that. But the reality is those individuals can't prove who they are. And just because of the skill level that's found inside of this room, most of us can sit here and say, yeah, no. Right, go ahead. I encourage you to let them know, yeah, actually I use Linux and they get irate. No, you don't. Sure don't. I know you don't. You've got a Windows computer in that house. Love it. Fantastic. There's lots of stuff on YouTube about it. <laughs> so right now, the media, they don't like encryption. They don't like privacy. They don't like personal freedom. Everybody's talking about how too dangerous for us to have privacy. Think about all the people that are being private right now, they're doing it wrong. We should be held responsible for it, right? No. I disagree. I can tell you right now, personal opinion, no. However, there are a lot of people who want to stop you from being able to have privacy. But what I really
really want you all to build a Pokemon. Because it's not only do we have to have privacy, but we also need a way to create the exact start what we actually need. I should be able to go to somebody and prove who I am. You should be able to prove who I am. Oops. Or who you are. But actually, in all honesty, using these tools, you could actually say, hey, I'm going to prove exactly who you are simply because of the things that you have. We're going to discuss that. So, cyber terrorism. Mm. Huge threat. Everybody knows about cyber terrorism. Sort of a buzzword in the day. Everybody's worried about the fight. Scary. What's going to happen when we have digital pearl harvest? Mm. Yeah. Look at your textbook and things like that. Have you heard the term digital pearl harvest? That's the term that gets thrown around whenever you're up at that level where people are going to be all the keys. That's the term that they use. It's digital pearl harvest. Okay? Keep that in mind. You're going to see a huge investment work in this industry, into the security industry. This is how they push things. You have to be able to tell people there's something to be afraid of. And if they don't know to be afraid of it, you got to make sure that they know to be afraid of it. And then once they know to be afraid of it, you got to hmm. give them something that they can look at. And they will explain hmm. stuff like this. Okay? Hmm. Start off with those types of threats. Move towards that right now. The first one, who do we always need to save? The children. Children are being targeted not only by advertisers, but a whole bunch of other people. There are children's toys, and of course, if you brought your machine, I have a link taking you straight to the archive.is. Talking toys accused of recording and sharing kids' secrets. Okay? Oh, they have them. They have them on the sound. GG. It's all there for you to take a look at if you're interested. But there are children's toys right now that are designed and developed specifically to gather intelligence-related data on the individual who has access to the toy. Not only that, the companies involved, and I just want to say this PDF is used without permission for educational purposes only, okay? But if we go here, and I pull up this PDF, Nuance is a company that handles data recognition and voice recognition for the military. So all the information that's coming over through SIGINT, okay, signals intelligence, they gather up all your voices, all your conversations, everything. It goes through this company's database and they take it and they mine it so that they can learn about who you are, what you do, what you like, how your voice sounds, and to make their database better. Okay, so keep in mind, we have a children's toy that is designed specifically for kids to play with and talk to and it says stuff like, hey, you know what would be really cool? If we went to Epcot Center do you like Disney? What's your mom's name? What's your dad's name? What's your date of birth? What's your dad's date of birth? There is tons of questions that are asked by this toy. What and then that fuck? data is gathered up and sent to the nuance identifier. This is your okay? ass crank. And it's delivering solutions to safer world. And what they do is they gather all that information up and they mine it. And they take names and they take date of birth and they take words that are spoken and they take all of that and they look through it so they can kind of figure out when they're listening to other targets what words are being said automated through an automated method. Now keep in mind, who wants to sit around and listen to conversation after conversation after conversation, right? We, can't, we physically can't do that. You can't pay a person enough money to spend every waking moment of their life just listening to people on the phone talk about nothing in the hopes that eventually you'll just pinpoint when they said something terrorism related and then you can jump on them. You have to have a way of piling through this information, whether it's voice data, whether it's uh, imagery, whether it's anything. We need that to artificial it. intelligence, we need that toolkit that can <laughs> go through all that data and find everything we don't care about and just get rid of it, right? Make sense? So this is what they are designing. This is 
what they're working on, this is what they're building, this is what they're feeding. They take that information and they give it to the teacher so that they can learn what's being said. And of course, a man's voice is different than a female voice, which is different than a children's or child's voice. Okay? Everybody's voice is different. So you need a whole lot of information so that you can hear different things happening in the background. as well as in law enforcement. So, for those of you who did not hear this, uh, Nuance is also the company that created Dragon Dictation, which is used in the medical industry for dictating, uh, as well as in law enforcement for dictating as well. So, they've got their hands in literally everything that has to do with force. Was that my dad? Isn't that a question to ask? So not only are they harvesting the data, but they're also selling advertisement space within that data. So you all heard me mention Epcot Center. So Disney actually buys advertising through these tools so that the toy will talk to the child and then say stuff like, you know what's super cool? Disney's super cool. Hey, do you like Mickey Mouse? Yeah, you know you do. Stuff like that. So that the entire time the child is interacting with Toy, not only gotcha. are they gathering up information from the kid, but in addition to that, they're supplying information to the child about what they should think, how they should feel, all of that additional information goes along with it. And of course, I made sure that there's links to all of this stuff, so for those of you who are going through the webpage, you can go through there and you can take a look at all of it to build your own opinion about what this potentially could be used for, okay? And again, all of this stuff, used without permission, but for education purposes only. Yeah. Another problem with this. Yo, How this I was lucky, natürlich. Locked, right? Ach, For sure, they're locking these things down. They're sticking these toys inside of kids' houses, having them talk to the kids. Super security, right? We're talking 10,000 bit encryption. No, not, nothing. Open Bluetooth. I can literally sit outside your house with my laptop, and if you have that toy in your home, I can hit that toy and it becomes a microphone, two-way microphone, actually. Mm. I talk to the child, Creepy. I listen to everything the child says. I do it all with my laptop. No security at all. Not poor security. There is a difference between poor security and no security. This is actual, legitimate, no security, none. You just connect to the toy, okay? Has anybody heard about the fact that a gentleman, uh, is actually, I believe he's still in the court case, but don't quote me on this. It may have already been settled, but he actually broke into one of these toys databases and pulled all of the imagery of the children because the toy was designed where you take a picture of the kid and then you can add that to their profile and it makes like a little web page for them and all this stuff. So he broke into that database and pulled all of their voice data, he pulled all of their photos, he pulled all of the information about the kids and then he went to the company and said, hey, all of this is available and open to the internet. So what did they do? Obviously, they secured the database and then thanked that gentleman with a reward, right? Anzeige is raus. No, they didn't. If you guess that they sued him, had him arrested, seized the database back, even though it was already open and out to the internet, a whole bunch of other people have already downloaded it, and then claimed that he's the whole sole reason why that security was like that. He broke in and he downloaded that file and it's obviously his fault. When he did the download, it just opened everything up. He opened Pandora's gate, all his fault. For good. That's what happened to that guy. So for those of you who are my students, or who have been my students, because I see some past students in here as well, everybody knows that I always talk about the No Saturday Night Special. If you remember back in the 90s, the big thing was Saturday Night Special. That was a firearm of choice. Ja, yeah, ich fühle schon, ich fühle mich langsam wie als wäre ich ein Student von diesem Guy.
bring this up because a lot of us are. We're penetration testers. We work on stuff. Sometimes our companies or the people we work for even say, hey, find out how to secure this better. But keep in mind that it is not unheard of for companies to find out that something is so grossly insecure it is unsolvable and potentially a detriment to the company, a.k.a. solvency. That company will no longer exist if people found out what they were doing. And then the people who actually found this stuff get in trouble. Okay? And you can find incident after incident after incident of this online. You just go look through the news. Start Googling for pen testing. However, I would like to redact the word Googling and the word duck, duck, go. So. Yeah. What about adults? We've been talking about kids this whole time. What about us? We're all adults, right? Most of us. Adults are being targeted, too. We know this. We know this for a fact. We're targeted with advertisements. We're targeted with information data mining. If you have a car, and that car has any kind of like GPS or anything else, they monitor all of that. Uh, Nissan GTR. That's a cool car, right? Pretty neat. Some of us are like, oh yeah, Nissan GTR, I take one of those. Except for the fact that that actually has a map inside of the vehicle that maps every single place you've ever taken the car in the history of the car. And they will actually go through that data and verify that at no time you were at a drag strip or at a racetrack go in for your car service, unless you have a service contract with them that says that you can go to the approved racetrack. In Japan, the car is actually limited, where you cannot reach past, I think it's like 85 miles per hour in that vehicle, unless it is actually located at a specific set of racetracks. So the car actually has to be able to get it to the right place, or they speak this weird language. Before, it will intelligently allow the vehicle. Ich habe es mein Leben lang falsch ausgesprochen, glaube ich. Right now, we 
gotta get through all the fat. <laughs> you can turn pretty much anything electronic into a covert system device. You just can. Okay? There's tools for everything, and everything is essentially Linux now. For those of you who are sort of on the fence about becoming a security researcher, I'm gonna tell you all a personal story. And this, I hope, doesn't scare you all away. But you should know about this story. Everybody knows about Twitch, right? Twitch TV. So my idea is to create a Twitch channel where I sit there and I play video games and they talk about cybersecurity related stuff. So you have fun, but then you also have like cybersecurity stuff. Imagine cybersecurity and video games at the same time. <laughs> serious, but you gotta like look at it at the same time. So what do I do? I go down and I buy an Aver Media game capture card. And I get up at three o'clock in the morning because I'm a busy dude and I'm like, all right, three o'clock in the morning, I can make some videos and stuff like that, and this will be cool. The game capture card has an application for your phone. And the phone, you log in and then you pair that phone to the device and then you have control over the device from your phone so that you can sort of control it while you're still playing the game on the screen. It makes sense. It's a smart idea. So, however, when I try to install the application on my phone, it pops up and it says, hey, this application is not going to start, it's not going to keep working. Eventually it's going to be phased out and you're not going to be able to use it anymore. Right? And I will just lost this thing. That sucks. And I thought, well, I just wanted And I thought, well, if I send it back, though, what does that say about me as a computer programmer? So what do, what do you think I'm doing at 4 o'clock in the morning? I got Wireshark open, the phone, and I'm PCAPing <laughs> this application, and I'm looking for documentation online for the API, and I'm like, I'm going to make this work. And then I find that there is an actual request that goes to the box that says, hey, I'm... I'm connecting to the box, let's go ahead and do a register. And I thought, well, that's important, it's a curl request. And because I already mass scanned the box to see what ports were open and everything filtered. And so I'm like, all right, but I found the port that's being used for the API. It's like 2174, something like that. And I'm like, this is cool. I'm, I'm on the track. I'm all right, we're reverse engineering right here. And so I send the request, and it says, hey, here's your little number, this is the registration. And I thought, okay, that's an important number. I'm going to have to use that for every single request, right? That's your API request number. Obviously, we're going to get that. Then I send the curl request and turn the box on without the number, and it goes, boop, comes right back up. That's weird. Okay, ich muss nochmal, ich habe jetzt nicht zugehört, weil ich gelabert habe. That's your. And so I send the request, and it says, hey, here's your little number, this is the registration. I thought, okay, that's an important number. I have to use that for every single request, right? That's your API request number. Obviously, we're going to need that. Then I send the curl request to turn the box on without the number, and it goes, boop, comes right back up. That's weird. So then I sent the ones that turn it off. Boop, it's off. No code, no nothing, no registration. And then I realized the whole box is just open. And it's 7 o'clock in the morning, and I'm sitting there with a cup of coffee, still in my underwear, P-capping an Avermedia game capture card instead of playing the video game that I wanted to play while furiously trying to essentially deconstruct this API. And then that's when you realize what you do is cybersecurity and not a whole lot else. So that's, <laughs> that's where you are. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, it's fun, but it will take you down a rabbit hole. You will get involved in stuff like you would believe. But Let's get into operational security, the real operational security. Now, I do want to make a warning as we go further down here. You will see there are two link links. Those links are for the Republic of 4chan. Potentially offensive material. <laughs> okay? Just keep it in mind. Potentially. Has anybody ever heard loose lips sink ships? Few of you? Okay, loose lips sink ships have been around for a long time. I'll break it down for you for those of you who don't know what this means. It means if you run your mouth, people could die. It's that easy. You talk, people die. And this, if 
you have ever been in the military, if you have ever been in law enforcement, if you have ever been in medical, if you have ever been in essentially anything where other people's lives depend on you, you will hear these words spoken. Okay? Make it even easier. Stop telling people everything about yourself. That easy. Okay? However, Use this for our advantage. <laughs> yeah, boom. I talk about measure, countermeasure, all the time. If you're a student in my class, you have heard me constantly. Oh, the other bomb is gewachsen. This is this lie. It goes back and forth, okay? Over and over. Here, for the camera. What do people have? For their job search, they use what? LinkedIn. LinkedIn? People use LinkedIn, right? Companies use LinkedIn. People love LinkedIn. There's a whole bunch of tech companies, but if you don't have a LinkedIn, essentially you're not getting an interview. However, I got a message from somebody who asked me, hey, I go to your cybersecurity meetup. What do I do to get a job? How do I do this? And I wrote back and I said, if you're going to these meetings, you're a hacker. You gotta be. You wouldn't come to these meetings if you weren't ever interested in being a hacker. Learning how things work, learning how to deconstruct stuff. So let's start with that. Loose lips think shit, but it could also potentially get you a job. First thing you need to do is you get on your Indeed and you find all the people who are looking to hire, right? And you start picking out those people, but you don't apply yet. You just need to get a list of jobs. And you head on over to LinkedIn, and you take those lists of jobs, and you start finding out who works there. And you start finding out what certifications they have, because the question was posed, what certification should I get to get a job? I don't know. Guess what? Nobody in this room knows. I can tell you that right now. Spoiler alert. Nobody can tell you exactly what certifications to go out and get. It's impossible. Because no matter what job it is that you're going to go out and try to get, somebody wants something. They just do. Everybody has a different opinion. I know people who, if they see you have a certified certified ethical hacker certification, they will laugh you out of the building. They don't like that certification, but they like other ones. And then there are people who look at a CEH and they go, oh man, this is a kick-ass cert. And they love it. But you need to know what they think about that certification, right? Every single one of you. So if you're looking for a job, what do you do? You go to their LinkedIn, find out what certifications do they have, what are they proud of, what are they adding to their documentation to show people what their biggest accomplishments are. Find their list. Find all the stuff that they're discussing, and then you build yourself a game plan. And you use that game plan to decide, okay, I want to work at these companies, and they all share these certifications as things that they're doing. What do you think that they're going to be looking for when they all sit down? Do you think they're going to be looking for other certifications? Or, are you going to think, or do you think they're going to look for something more homogenous? Everybody kind of agrees on what's like the cool thing and what's not, right? It's kind of like that everywhere. And so the next thing you know, you have a list of exactly what you need to do for your career based off of exactly who it is that you want to communicate with and exactly how you want to work. But it's just analysis. Okay? It's all intelligence analysis. It's OSINT. You all, are you all familiar with the term OSINT? Open Source Intelligence. People put information out on the internet, you're allowed to it. Or, yes, but careful. <laughs> Just because they put it out on the internet doesn't mean it. But even our military, currently, had to change loose lips, think shift, to weak, think, weak. Think often. Operational security, right here. George Weak can potentially end people's lives. And here in a minute, we're actually going to see where that's happened. To show you some actual events in the meeting. We actually did that. Okay? So it's not just like me talking just saying stuff, like we're actually going to see real life examples of every single event. 
contact your FSO if you suspect a security breach. Do you know that if you're a soldier right now, if you have Facebook, you will have members of ISIS as well as other terrorists related to attempting to use your Facebook, friends with you, uh, create contacts with relatives and or friends, and so on and so forth. Tip of the day, it happens, okay? And this is a real and true thing. They are using open source intelligence, and it is easy, and it is simple, and it is not difficult at all, and it's not magic. This is the most basic of the basics. How do you find out about this? people? You ask them, or you listen, right? Ah, uh, boah, was ein flop. So let's go back. If you like that poster and you'd like more, I've also included a link to the CDSE, which is the Center for Development of Security Excellence. That's the U.S. government, and they make like posters and information, and they make all the bulletins and so on and so forth. And you can actually come on here. There's tons of them. You know, the attachment. This one's kind of cool. I like this one. Look, she's super scared of that attachment. Don't open it. <laughs> Guy. I like that. But there's tons and tons of stuff here that they're building specifically to try to explain to soldiers, sailors, airmen, and so on and so forth that what you're doing on the computer matters and you need to be careful. And guess what? It's all free information that you can all use too. Okay? And it's good information. But what about the incidents, you say? What about all these happenings? Well, let's start with Israel. Israelis forced to cancel raid after an individual got on Facebook and posted some selfies and said, hey, I'm about to go out on a raid in this area. Can't wait. It's going to be super cool. Don't do that. Vice pro tip. If you were about to go out on a secret raid, tweeting about it. Don't do it. So, this is not the only one. I want to make that clear. This is just a small collection of them, but it got to the point where I was like, I'm just going to do the top five because I was already at 25. And I was like, mm, we don't need to do 25. That kind of wastes our time. But top five. Okay, so this is the Israeli one. I like this one because they literally come out and say, don't go on to social media and post your secrets. Just don't do it. It's great. United States. And I do two United States ones. U.S. military forced to investigate Facebook group spreading naked pictures of service members. I'm going to tell you right now, this was dumb. Super dumb. You do not do this. Just don't. Okay? This is... If, for those of you who came to my last class, the, the last discussion that we have where I taught about the people in the Philippines who were going out there and taking imagery and uh, taking data from people and getting their naked pictures and stuff like that and using it to attack them. Same level. I have absolutely zero tolerance for this. None. Zero tolerance. You don't do this. Uh, but these individuals decided what they would do would make a secret Facebook group. There is no such thing. There is no such thing as a secret Facebook group. And they traded information and personal data about fellow soldiers. That is wrong on so many levels about so many people. Severely, severely damaged. Imagine for a moment that you're passing out information secretly about an individual who is then preyed upon by people who blackmail that person and tell them, I've got these naked pictures of you because I broke into your computer, even though that's not true. But I've got these, these photos of you, and I'm going to send them out to the whole world. If you don't give me information about the race that you're going on, I want information about the people that you're about to go hit. Tell me about it, or else that data goes out. Shame, money, Love, those are all very, very 
very powerful motivator. It's how you get people. Get people. Okay? All of them are tools for making people do things for you. That right here is serious reach. This isn't just like, ha, 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 naked pictures. I told some of my students about this, and one of them was like, well, what I'll do is I'll just take all my junk pictures and put them in with my resume, and then nobody can get me because you've already got them. Come on, dude. Mm. Not everybody. But, go to the next one. I think it's geil, that this Werbung einfach keinen Sound hat. Das ist sehr praktisch. US military social media accounts hacked by Islamic State sympathizers. This happens all the time. It is not difficult to get access to social media. It's not, it's not difficult to get into your Twitter. It's not difficult to get into any of this stuff. They do it all the time. So anything that you're putting in there, again, secret Facebook groups will betray information and intelligence on other people. Ich glaube, mein Laptop kämpft echt, Leute. Mit einem YouTube-Video abspielen. Haha, right <laughs> Virus <Central> ist da. <laughs> CENTCOM. Now members of the cyber community. Okay? And I'm sure we've all seen this. We've all seen it on the news, we've all seen it literally everywhere. Sorry. Uh, happens also all the time. Is is okay, but what you are putting information wise out onto the internet, just consider it open and accessible. Like to the 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 and then here in a second we're going to talk about SS7. I said SS7, and before anybody Googles it, does anybody know what I'm talking about when I discuss SS7? No. Telecommunications, thank you. It will not just but actually, within the U.S., the SS7 is the actual underlying telecommunications system for every single cell phone provider. Okay? So it's what links all of the cell phones together. It's like the cloud, sort of, above all the cell phones. So we'll get into that here in a little bit. But if they want your data, it has to. Okay? Now, I'm going to bring up this... It's bad word for all adults in here, okay? There's no, like, violence, no gore, no nothing like that. This is the first one. This is the night that 4chan coordinated an airstrike. Okay? And again, all of these images are available here, and if you don't know who Ivan is, Ivan Sidorenko, he's actually fighting out there in Syria, I believe. Um, some individuals members of a Islamic terrorist group decided to make videos. They made videos of themselves doing attacks, uh, training. It was a, a pretty detailed creation of all of the things that they were doing, including violence, including uh, you know beheading, so on and so forth. They created a very, very detailed video about, uh, sort of like a fan video, about how great they were. So what did these people do? They sat down and they looked at every single image frame by frame and they figured out where these videos were shot. And so then, after figuring out where the videos were shot, they then mapped them. And they created detailed maps of where every single one of these events were all the way down to, hey, here's an image of the two minarets and then here's where the minarets are located and then here is where the, the image was actually shot Right there, that's where the person was standing in order to get both of those images there mathematically. Okay, broke the whole thing down. And then, after they did all of this, and they started figuring out the entire event, they had the whole thing mapped out with detailed coordinates. They then reached out to Ivan, and they asked him, hey, bro, if we give you all this data, can you get it to the Russians? So they can bring in some airstrikes on these locations. And the guy said, yeah, sure, send it over to me. So they did. They were set down, and a whole bunch of anime guys sitting around with their laptops, computers, built a detailed strike chart, called it in over Twitter, and executed an area. Okay. Weaponized, 
problem with that, and I'll just I'll make a personal statement here, I guess. Uh, my father was in a motorcycle accident when I was a kid, and he lost a lot of his capabilities as a person for a long time because of a head injury. So I don't take like hitting somebody in the head like as a big no-no around me. I won't put up with that. So uh, because of the things that my family went through, but people can take information, every bit of information that goes on whether it's an image, a video, anything, you can take that data frame by frame and use that in order to find quite a bit of information, right? So, we talked about SSL before, but we're going to talk about it The reason why is because we're going to, I am going to say, when you are communicating with web pages, how do you do so with SSL? SSL, correct? If you're going to communicate with a web page, you want that web page to have SSL. SSL is going to provide encryption for your connection. And it's going to protect things like usernames, passwords, and other information transfers. But if there's no information transfer, basic stuff, right? We all know this. Block post. However, block post SSL. SSL does not provide proof of data assurance and cannot prove that the data is true. It is only good for providing a layer of encryption over the data. There is a difference between true data and encrypted data. Let's make that very, very clear. Just because something is encrypted does not necessarily mean that it is true. It does not. I can encrypt anything. I'm from Microsoft. Send it on over. I need access to your computer. Anybody can encrypt anything. Encryption is not proof. I got a link in here. Fake SSL certificates that are actually trusted by the people who deploy those certificates are in the wild. Google super bent. Bent enough that they banned some of these um, uh, individuals who were deploying certificates like Simon Tech, Simon Tech, Symantec. All right, I don't use them, so I don't use another name. They issued thirty thousand certificates improperly. I also don't use Norman for sure. <laughs> for sure on that one. So. 30,000 certificates improperly handled, okay? So you just, here you go, google.com, you want google.com, SSL certificate, here it is, you trust it. You hook that up to a domain, put that into a, a web browser, it'll come back green. It'll show that little lock. And it'll say, hey, issue by semantics. The mishandling of these SSL certificates led to Google restricting the use of those certificates on the Chrome browser. It actually comes up and says, this certificate sucks. Not exactly like that, but pretty close. And it tells you, you cannot use this. And it shows a little broken lock. Because every single time Google went to this company and told them, stop issuing certificates improperly, they said, okay. And then they immediately went out and continued issuing the same thing can happen with GPG because Bit9, who is now part of Black um, Hour protecting resource within, right? They were found and all their keys were stolen and our authors were signing malware with those same exact keys. Yes, but that's that yes, but that's a different event. But, but yes, and we will talk about keys. Uh, the, it wasn't really a question, it was a statement, but no. there was a discussion here about the fact that certain people have had their keys stolen. And then those keys were used to sign. Ah, my own. Sign, uh, like malware. And that is true. That has occurred. However, we'll get to that. So let's talk about download assurance. And actually, that's kind of nice that you brought that up. Because we're going to talk about Linux Mint and how Linux Mint will compromise. Now, hold on. I do want to say very clearly. Yeah. Okay. So I want to 
gritty prime time, and there's a whole bunch of stuff like that inside of here, then it's total garbage. Okay, Linux is 100% ready for prime time. If anybody's ready for prime time, it's Linux. Okay, Linux is a good operating system. I like Linux. If you are able to take over a web page, guess what? You're not going to break the SSL. If I have access to your WordPress web page, like with a shell, if I get a, a shell into your WordPress web page, I can start pushing data to your WordPress web page, and it's not going to affect that big green check mark in the corner. It just won't. It's not going to make any changes there. So what we need is separation of failure. If we have a failure in one place, we still need to be covered in other places. Just like with everything else, literally everything else. This is all a very fancy way of saying we need a backup plan. In the event that something terrible occurs, how are we going to resolve the issue that was created? Okay? Um, an individual gained access to the Linux Mint Forum. Upon gaining access to the Linux Mint Forum, they were then able to pivot to the web page. After pivoting to the web page, this guy was like, well, I can actually upload files to the web page. So I'm going to take this copy of Linux Mint and I'm going to bring it down off the web page and I'm going to replace it with one that's filled with malware. And so he put that up there. And then being a smart guy, he said that he actually did the GPG signature key for his copy and replaced the key on the web page with a key that said, yeah, this is real and true. So the place that you would go to to get the key to, prov to provide proof that the binary was real and true was the same place that you went to go get the binary. So all he had to do was compromise one web page, and then he was able to disassemble the entire page and put it all back together using nothing but bad data. Okay? All he had to do was get his foot in one door. Aber ist doch immer so eigentlich, oder? That single door, he had access to everything. Das ist auch die Sache, die mich immer wundert. Also, Sache.
can't really see it that well. But you can actually get the SHA using that command right there, switch B, on the ISO, so you can then start doing verification. And every single one of these numbers is going to match. Okay? And that's how you know that it's real and true. Then you can use GPG to head out to the key server, and you can receive the key specifically signed for that ISO. And guess where it's coming from? Ubuntu. Just like I stated earlier. Ja, ich meine, alles schön und gut, aber solange das nicht in einem Handy-Skript automatisiert ist, ja gut, dann ist das Skript wieder in einem Place und dann, ja, aber, ne, ne, so viel Arbeit, ne. And then once you've received that key, then you can fingerprint, to make sure that the key is real and true, and then finally, you can verify everything using GPG, using the sum.txt, ja, aber es kostet halt Zeit. Warte, und die Instructions sind alle an einem Ort? Ja gut, dann muss ja nur einmal der Instruction-Ding gefickt werden und dann... Snap a couple of pictures, 
all year round. <laughs> Creep. You can go make a Facebook and put a name and a photo and a whole bunch of data to that, and I can become that person. And if you don't think that that's happening, that happens every single day. People make fake Facebooks for people constantly. It is a constant thing. And of course, Facebook hates that because it poisons their data set. And so they will look for those things to get rid of them. And they also look for like all the role play people. People make like role play. I'm a Toho character, and here's my little anime picture, and here's my Facebook, and I'm Luigi. Like, but they hate that because it screws up their facial recognition. It still screws up their accounts for being able to monitor who people are. All of that stuff is poisonous data, so they constantly trim it. Theoretically. Unless you give information out, you shouldn't be able to collect that information. If you're not on the internet, right, you should be able to get data about you. Well, that's not necessarily the case. I'm going to make a very, very small uh, guess about some changes that are going to come. If you're not aware, there's a lot of public records out there on the internet. Tons of public records. I can get online right now with your name and essentially find out every member of your family if you've ever bought a car, bought a house, if you've ever started a business, if you've literally done anything with the government, the government, due to the Open Data Initiative, takes all of your information and pushes it up to the internet, and there are people who are sucking on the end of that fire hose and putting all your data out on the internet. I have tracked people all over the world with open source intelligence that comes from open records. All right, I'm just gonna tell you right now, done a thing, you are probably on some sort of list on some web page somewhere where it's you, your family, your kids, and then they got a list on there that says, we also think that you're involved with these people. Those, those data sets are sometimes so sophisticated that even if you change your name, you can still send it back to who the original is. Right, because for you to change your name, you're going to have to do it through, guess what? The government. And so the minute you put information into the government, the open data initiative means your data is going to go out back straight into that company that you were trying to escape from. Some states have protection from this, but only if you are a victim of stalking or domestic violence. However, that also means you have to go track down every single web page that has your data on it and tell them, this is me, here's proof that it's me, so now you know your data is good, and Here's all of this very personal stuff about an incident in my life where I have to tell people about terrible things that happened to me over and over and over again just to try to get them to pull that information off of being online. My thoughts, and this is personal, again, going back to a personal opinion, but I think that we are going to see changes in the way that these laws are applied within probably the next three to five years. Because people are already starting to use this data to harass people who are in government. So there are mayors and there are people who are in uh, state representation and things like that. And people are starting to pull down their data and they go fly drones around their house and flash lights in the windows of their homes and stuff. And when terrible things happen to the normies, kind of, you know, that doesn't always high up in government, start going outside of their house and seeing drones with big signs. And uh, they're also working on pulling down all of the um, pornographic data in terms of like what porn web pages that certain people go watch. And once they have all that data, they're going to start releasing that specifically for like state representatives and people who work in government just to kind of demonstrate like if you want to put our information out on the internet, great, we're going to do the exact same thing to you. So this is going to push a lot of these groups to make very drastic changes in the way that this data is handled. I would be surprised if in, within five years they have not made changes to the law that either protect all of us or protect a certain subsect of people. Okay, certain subsect meaning like once you hit a certain level of government, they're going to like cut you off from having to worry about this. But there will be changes to the way this is handled. I encourage all of you to pay attention to that in the news and do you know, follow who supports protections against this kind of stuff. So, however you want to.
take that. What? But, I mean, full circle to TV. Was? Talk about TV first. War das grad, hat man da gerade was zwischen den Zeilen hören können? Oder habe ich, hab ich mich verhört? Hat er gerade gesagt, dass alle Leute, die höhere Ränge haben und dafür sind, äh, dass da sich was verändert, unter Angriff stehen oder so und man die mal recherchieren soll und sich dann an die wenden oder was auch immer? Keine Ahnung. Oder hat er einfach nur irgendwas gesagt? Ich weiß es nicht. Bin ich zu smart genau. Speed? Boah, Leute. Irgendwann mal schaue ich dieses Wort nach. Uh, again, I have no idea. I have no connection to these people. I don't know who they are or what they're doing. And the potential that at any time somebody from uh, the FISA court could step in and be like, do the thing. And they go, well, I don't want to do the thing. And they say, well, here's the FISA court order. You do the thing. That potentially that can happen. Okay? Especially because it looks like a lot of their developers are here in the US. And guess what? That means we are, as US developers, Potentially, somebody can come in and be like, you do the thing. And you are just looking for that. Okay? If you don't know what I'm talking about, FISA. Click on go. Sorry, I got to So, they have a neat little tool, and I like it because it's sort of. I like the whole idea behind it. I like everybody having to find stuff. We're digital fitness. There's also people who are looking at this in terms of blockchain. You need to be able to prove who you are, prove proof of life, Julian Assange. Any of that stuff, they're, they're using the blockchain for that. I don't know if I entirely agree with that. There's some parts of that that I look at and I, again, like with Julian Assange, when he signed the blockchain to say, well, I'm still alive. I mean, I don't know about you all, but I type J. I type a whole bunch of different letters into my keyboard. So if you don't have a way for people to digitally sign, which this is the part of the thing with PGP, you would have like a signing party. Okay, so let me break this down. We would all come in and we would trade keys and we would all like verify who we are. And there's different rules. Sometimes you have to bring a government ID. Sometimes you've got to bring somebody to vouch for you. It just depends on the, the method that's chosen. And then you show up with your little government ID or your homies, whoever it is, and you all come together sign together to say, okay, yes, I know this guy right here, and I trust him, and I believe he is who he says he is, and he's not under duress, and so I'm signing this to say that at this point in time, this key is good, and he is good, and I trust him, and then a whole bunch of other people do the exact same thing, and then we go round robin doing the exact same thing, and so of course it helps to have big names, um, the more people better, and then in addition to that, the more people know other people. The whole idea is a web of trust. You're going to hear that. For those of you who are going to take this information and go out and start doing some studies on this topic, it's a web of trust. But you don't have to use a service. You can use GPG. Okay? So I show how to generate a revocation certificate. First thing you should do is make a certificate that if you have your key, Once you have your ID or your key, you can create a certificate that says, if this certificate goes out, that means that null and void on my, my actual certificate, I'm revoking. Why? For safety and security. If something happens, you revoke the key so nobody else can use it. Here's some instructions on how to actually send that key to a server. You can take the full key ID and you can send it up to like SKS key servers. And then if you want to back up your keys, here's how to do it. So I have a little breakdown for those of you who are interested in GPG, and you want to start learning how to do it, here's how to create the keys, here's how to back them up, here's how to create revocation certificates, here's all the stuff that you need to get started. It's GPG party in a, in a box, okay? The whole thing is all broken down. Now 
let's start getting into threats because we're getting close to the end. There are a lot of threats. A lot. And I could sit up here and I could just make everybody depressed. Because I could talk about all the terrible things that are going on in the world and how everything sucks and the whole thing's on fire. And it's bad. Okay? We can talk about that all day. But I'm going to talk about some of the more effective ones that are in the arsenal of the threat actor. These are the, these are the ones that make you money. First one, whale fishing. This is a specific form of fishing, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to read to you the little whale fishing email that I created, and then we'll break it all down and actually figure out exactly what whale fishing is. Retro 64 XYZ. The business is at risk because we forgot to pay our bill to Nigerian Superconductors, LLC. I know we usually pay them bi-weekly, but the bank forgot to clear one of our checks, and now we owe a double payment. Can you please send a payment of $1,800,000 to Nigerian Superbank, account number 12345, routing number 54321, please don't ask. If we don't pay it, they will stop making the chips we need, and the whole business will go bust. Hurry. Also, don't call me because I am obviously on vacation in Idaho where I go all the time because that is where my mom lives, and you know that because it is information you can find on my Facebook. Please pay quick. We covered all of our bases, right? If I was a thief, this is an awesome email. See if it's spelled right, okay? What we want is a call to action with a feeling of urgency. What's the feeling of urgency? The whole business is screwed up and you're the only person that can save it. You, on your shoulders, right now. You're the most important person in the world right now or else we're all eating dirt for the rest of our lives. So we, we have urgency, right? Then we have a call of action. What's the call to action? Send money. Got to send that money right now. Could be passwords. Could be accounts. It could be pictures. Uh, it could be contact information. I'm trying to do intelligence analysis on a person. I'm trying to find out more on this person. I'm digging deeper. You send a whale fishing email like this to somebody and you say, I gotta get so-and-so's address right now. If you don't send me their address so I can get over there and work with them, the whole world's on fire. Everything's burning to the ground. And the next thing you know, thinking, well, it's not money. Well, who could use this information? Why is this even important? You type up an email and say, oh, hey, yeah, yeah, no, you're right. I, I didn't realize that you were a, a law enforcement officer that needed this information about this person because the child is sick. Here is their address, and here's their phone number, and here's all the information that you need. You can go sit out in front of a, a, a house behind a bush waiting for that person to come out so you can hit them. That is the way that people gather data. Urgency, call to action. The information is important. That power line sitting in the background means the difference between eating dinner and getting a rock. We've already seen that. Real life examples, right? Now I do admit, hey, this is a silly example, but it's going to cover all the bases that you see in a real whaling. What did I do? I did a little research. I applied the research in there. What did I do? I went to Facebook and I found out that such and such person goes to Idaho all the time because they need to take care of their sick mom. And they post all the time things like, pray for my mom. And they show pictures of the, the, you know, the angels praying and stuff like that. So I know that they constantly have to be traveling and they have to go places. All of this is information that you can use to build whatever it is story-wise that you're going to have to use. So we... We being those of us who work in security, what do we have to do? We have to be able to teach people, don't get hit by that. Just because somebody says something doesn't mean it's true. Just because it's encrypted doesn't mean that it's true. There's no authority there. We have to be able to prove authority. Okay? And then I let them know, hey, in a silly way, don't verify any of this information because I'm gone. But in reality, how would you do it? You would tell them, my cell phone's dead, 
or in I Idaho, I don't have access to my cell phone. Why? Well, don't even call it because they don't have a tower. It's Idaho, right? Why would Idaho have cell phones? I've never been to Idaho. I would know the difference. But it's all about making a story that's believable enough to get people to take action in the way that you want to. And guess what? It can be believable. If I know that you're constantly complaining about a bank that you do business with, and I go in there and I say, oh, I know. The bank held the check. Shoot up the check again for the third time they did it. You go, oh man, that's good information. Where did that come from? Open, open source intelligence. I go in and I look at your Facebook. I look at your sharply worded Yelp review about the bank that you do business and how they never, ever, ever put in the checks on time correctly. You might not even go check because they're so used to it. The next one is fraud. This one is this one is probably one that we're all seeing. You'll either see it on your credit card, okay, or somebody charges something to your credit card, but it's low enough that they hope that you won't notice. Anywhere from twenty-five dollars for a Steam account or for an Xbox little gift card, or for a business, it can be quite a bit more. Uh, most people are going to try to keep it under $250. But they'll send you an invoice. And they'll say, uh, you ordered mouse pads. You bought $25,000 worth of computers for all your employees. I'm going to follow in on that. I'm going to send you a bill for Two hundred fifty to five thousand dollars, depending on the size of your company, so on and so forth. But I'm send you a reasonable bill, and it'll say mouse pads. Who's gonna sit there and go, oh man, will you really you buy a bunch of accessories for all these computers? I mean, you know, five thousand bucks after I just blew fifty thousand dollars. I mean, is that is that so strange? No, I'll just pay it. And I, every single company I have ever worked at has received a B2B message whether it be a letter or an invoice or so on and so forth that says you owe us money. And they're not reasonable. Okay? And guess what they do? They go out to the city and they find a list using what? Open data of every single business. And then they take that list from every single business and they create invoices and they shotgun those invoices. Boom! 250 bucks per business. How many businesses do you think are in Phoenix? Chandler? Probably more than 10, right? You take your shotgun list of invoices, send that out to every single one of these businesses requesting $250. And now think of it, think for a minute, if you receive $250 from 10% of all of the businesses in the Phoenix area, you think you'd be doing all right? Yeah, right? You'd only have to do that maybe like once a year. And you do that once a year and you get 10% from every 10% of the victim throughout the entire Phoenix metro area and you hit them for 250 bucks a piece, you're making you're making a little bit of money. But we're cybersecurity experts, right? We're geniuses. We're not gonna fall for that. Guess who just fell for that for a hundred million dollars? Google. Some guy sat down at his computer, and he went to LinkedIn, and he went to a bunch of other web pages, and he pulled up all the Google people, and then he pulled up the I don't know how many people here work with like the stock market, but you can actually look up filings from companies. Okay, so you can sit down and you can pull up the filings for a company, and you can actually see all of their business dealings. Because when you are a publicly traded company, there is certain information that you must make public. So if I'm a publicly traded company and I buy fifty million dollars worth of servers, guess what? That's a pretty big number, and that means that that affects the people who own stock in that company. Aber wieso wird die Information so dann nicht nur an Leute rausgegeben, die auch äh, Aktien haben? Oder haben sich die Leute einfach Aktien geholt? Also, keine Ahnung. Aber es muss ja nicht öffentlich, öffentlich sein.
Krasse Story. But, aber wenn die zweimal, also haben die dann nicht zweimal dieselbe Rechnung bekommen? Das ist eh eine gute Idee, hier mal in Home zu setzen, weil das ist eh eine viel krassere Base als die andere mittlerweile. Also, what the fuck? Die Frage ist halt, habe ich meine Wolle weggeworfen oder nicht? Privacy, anonymity, authorship assurance, 
These are all important aspects and deserve equal focus by both the security community as well as the public. Okay? It is imperative that the next generation of security researchers be able to not just move in secrecy, but provide proof of self. We cannot become so engrossed in the secret squirrel stuff that we forget the practical and useful. It's more than just hiding or sending encrypted messages. Sometimes it's as much about being able to prove who you are. In addition to that, sometimes people are proving who you are without you knowing. Anybody know the name Reality Winner? What? Yeah, a couple of you. The young lady? Yeah. So there was a young lady who worked at the NSA. Yep. And she decided she was going to leak documents. She was going to be the next big leaker. And they immediately caught her. Why? Because she started printing the documents to the NSA, packed them up, Guess what? That printer marks every document. Her computer marks every document. Literally everything. I'm going to tell you all a little secret. Okay? This is a pretty important secret that you should all keep in mind. I, as a sysadmin, if I'm on your network and I have control over your network, I know what you're doing. Everything that you're doing. If you're not doing something on my network, that I will not know what you're doing. Because even if you're using Tor, we talked about this previously. Right? I will know you're on tour. And that's what I need to know. Because that's outside of your wheelhouse. Unless you use tour constantly and continuously and every day and all the time, then I am going to know that you're doing something weird. And then you immediately become a suspect. Okay? Just like with the kid who tried to call in the bomb threat at his college. What do they do? Meint ihr, es gibt Leute, die nur über Tor ins Internet? Ja, doch, vielleicht irgendwo. Aber, also Europäer, die nur über Tor ins Internet gehen, Digga, da kannst du gleich im, im Baumhaus leben. Krass, oder? Das ist ja, ich meine, was das für ein Struggle wäre. Huh, fuck. I broke the thing. Hm, ja, keine Ahnung. Könnte man mal machen. So als Experiment. Es gibt auch so Leute, die, keine Ahnung, einen Monat vegan, einen Monat minimalistisch, einen Monat nur über Tor oder einen Monat detoxing, was auch immer. Das ist mal eine Challenge. Did you call on the bomb threat? Yeah, dude. Why? Because they were able to pinpoint it directly to him. Why? Because he was the only person on tour at the exact time when the bomb threat happened. And as soon as the bomb threat happened, he was off tour. That's weird. It's about the additional information that you can use to figure out what's going on. It's not about hiding everything. It's not about being a secret person who steals documents and sticks it all in a thing and then sends it out and then nobody's ever going to find out. Because guess what? If you are working on a computer, they know. If you're using a printer, they know. If you're using a television, they know. Uh, uh, I have <laughs> Ich habe auf die falsche Leertaste gedrückt. Ähm, ich finde, dass er ein bisschen so redet, wie als wäre es ein Publikum Kriminelle. Also, findet ihr nicht auch? Ein bisschen. Hm. Er erklärt nicht, wie man Leute erwischt, die Sachen in Tor machen. Er erklärt, hm, dass man, wenn man nicht erwischt werden will, immer ein Tor bleiben soll. Wisst ihr, was ich meine? Hm. Ich meine... Das ist wahrscheinlich so eine Sache mit ähm, Datensicherheit, Anonymität und so, die Werte, die er da auch vermitteln will. Hm dass man da immer ein bisschen klingt, wie als wäre man einer von den Bösen, keine Ahnung. Aber, ja, weiß nicht, er könnte das vielleicht ein bisschen weniger kriminell verkaufen, in meiner Meinung nach. We were discussing that, and uh, I told them 
pay anything on your cell phone, you cannot assume that it is private. Right. And for the next five minutes, they're all going to leave. Delete. Delete. And yes, always count. Any kind of electronic device that you have potentially is compromised. Keep it in mind. It's just a, it's the thing to think about, okay? Uh, Keine schöne Vorstellung, aber. We did the challenge. Congratulations again. You're awesome Mountain Dew. Let me know how that is. Final recommendations, and then we're going to open up for questions, and then we'll be out of here just a little bit, okay? Register a PGP. Use Keybase if you're uncomfortable managing it yourself. Keybase is pretty neat. Don't trust it with your life, okay? If your life depends on your PGP key, do not use Keybase for the, the tool. Not at this time. Probably not ever. Okay? If it's the difference between you staying alive and you dying, that's not the tool you use. Welches tool However, sollte man denn dann verwenden? It is a new tool. Er sagt nur, was man nicht verwenden kann. Was kann man denn noch sicher verwenden, whatever. Leute? It's, it's something that you can use to build up towards, hey, every communication that I do is encrypted. Me, I use Signal. Is the Signal app secure? Probably not, who knows. But guess what? For every single person that I communicate with, I communicate with them through Signal. If you send me a text message, I'm going to send you a message back that says, hey, get on Signal, and then we'll talk. That's just what I do. Why? Because I have built a history of using Signal, and in the future, in the event that it is ever called into question, were you using Signal? Yes, I use Signal. Is that weird? No, it's not. Why? Because I always use Signal. Same with Tor. Are you using Tor? Yes. Why? Because I use Tor. When we're using Tor all the time. It's not, I just get on Tor to do bad stuff. Jetzt klingt er wieder so, als würde er gelegentlich irgendwelche Bad Stuff Sachen machen. Wisst ihr, was ich meine? Ja, aber Aaron Jones, machst du Bad Stuff? Junge. Ich weiß, das ist die falsche Frage, aber... Was habe ich gesagt? And then I have a glossary in here. What's PGP? What's Galoo PGP? What's GPG for Win? Because there are some people who use Windows. No. And then of course there's key server and that's a little bit down somewhere. So we have a little bit of time. Open for questions. Anybody have any questions? Anything that I can answer or anything that I need to cover? Yes, uh, when you were talking about jobs, what would a Red Hat certification be pretty but something nice that people would consider? Sure. Uh, Red Hat is used in a ton of businesses. The vast majority of companies that are using Linux are using Red Hat. There's a lot of people who use Red Hat, and if they're not using Red Hat, they're using CentOS. So having some sort of like proof of concept, yes, I know how to use Linux, particularly Red Hat, particularly the fact that Mesa Community College is now Red Hat certified, and can give you a Red Hat certification if you are interested in going for continuing education, If you're looking for Red Hat oh, stuff, yes, there are places to go. Yes, Red Hat is a good certification. However, there are more than just those certifications. There's a ton of different ones. Are you going to find somebody using Manjaro Linux at a business? Probably not. I mean, it's just the likelihood is pretty low. Are you going to find somebody using Ubuntu server? Probably much higher than Manjaro. Are you going to find a business using Red Hat or CentOS? Probably even higher. Yes. Uh, so. Yes, some way of proving your Linux capabilities is very important for your resume. But in addition to that, like I said, it's breaking it down based on where do you want to work, what information do you need to have to put on that resume, and what's the most cost effective. If you look at that list and you see everybody has three certifications, potentially, if you can't afford it, looking at that list and finding the most expensive certification to get first may not behoove you. You may want to break it down from least expensive certification next least, and then finally the most expensive, you still have to go there. But if you can get your foot in the door, a lot of companies do pay for continuing education, so keep that in mind. Sometimes it helps to get the, whatever the minimum is, to get the 
foot in the door, and then once you're in, get them to pay for the rest of your education, okay? Yes. Can you explain why, in general, Linux operating system is safer compared with, uh, let's say, uh, Windows? Ooh, you want to start an argument. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to start a huge fight. So the question was presented, why is Linux, in general, considered safer than Windows? Let's go. So there are many reasons that people cite. I'm going to cite the reasons that people provide, and then I'm going to try to hope that nobody jumps up here to like fight me in the middle of the TV. <laughs> so, number one, there is an idea, and I agree with this idea on a personal level, that open source software is more secure than closed source software, regardless of the fact whether or not people are checking Man, that software. Das geht ja richtig ab hier. On the purpose of if there is a problem, fix it quicker and have more concern and care about those problems in a closed, in an open source operating system than in a closed source. Windows being closed source, aka you and I and anybody in this room legally do not have access to the Windows operating system source code, whereas all of us here have access to all of the source code that's available for them. Okay? So. Yeah. Nicht die Now, the counter argument to this is just because it's available doesn't mean people are looking at it. And, and that's just the fact of life. How many people can raise their hand and say that they have gone line by line through every piece of code in the Linux kernel? It, well, theoretically, even he has not. He looks at a lot of the stuff, but he, he does delegate some of it. So, when he started, sure, if we go all the way back to because Linux kernel 1.0, yep, he could, he could probably say, yes, I've looked at every single line of code on this. Now, not so much. Okay? So just because it is available doesn't mean anybody's using it. But it's, it's the potential for being there. Number two, the security... Also, irgendwer um, liest immer. Also, the underlying security style. Das klingt immer so, niemand hat alles gelesen. Ja, aber... Ich sag euch, jede Zeile, die da reinkommt, wird von irgendjemandem überprüft. So, das ist auf jeden Fall mal ein Fakt, den ich mir jetzt ausgedacht habe, aber ich bin mir ziemlich sicher, dass das so ist. Ähm, genau. Und das ist bei Klosters halt nicht zwingend der Fall. Oder da schauen weniger Leute drüber. In Linux is essentially the Soviet style, which is nothing to do with what we say is. That's why you should go up for everything. Whereas the underlying security system for Windows has traditionally been the American style of everything permitted, just do whatever you want unless we say that you can. Ja, aber schau mal, auch mit der, mit dem, niemand hat alles durchgelesen. Bei, bei Windows kann, wenn die etwas Fischiges machen, irgendwas, was halt nicht so geil ist, womit Leute ein Problem haben könnten, müssen die Windows-Menschen nur ihre paar Kollegen da überzeugen oder wer auch immer da involviert ist und sagen, hey, wir, wir setzen das jetzt durch, ähm, das könnte Leute stören, aber wir müssen es ja niemandem erzählen, seid ihr okay damit? Und dann sagen die, okay, ja, bla bla. Oder jetzt nicht bezogen auf Windows, sondern auf closed source projekte allgemein. Wollen wir alle Leute ausspionieren, bla, hast du nicht gesehen. So, und bei Open Source kann auch eine Person für sich selber entscheiden, ja, boah, ich will irgendwas total sketchy machen. Um, und dann kann es aber sehen, dass potenziell jemand das mitbekommt und ähm, diese Person, äh, man kann nicht mit allen Personen auf der Welt vorher absprechen, ähm, ja, ich will das und das machen und diese Person, die das mitbekommt, ist vielleicht nicht damit einverstanden und kann das dann ähm, verbreiten und dann wissen es plötzlich alle und dann gibt es Chaos und dann, äh, so, das, da ist schon eine gewisse Sicherheit, gerade bei so großen Projekten. Äh, im, im Open Source Bereich finde ich, äh, auch wenn niemand wirklich alles durchgelesen hat, wird da schon äh, aufgepasst. Ne? Ihr wisst, was ich meine. Oh mein Gott, also so ein Stack Eier ist echt für den Arsch. Ja, egal. So, weiter geht's. But that means that in general it's much easier to ride, run malicious code under Windows than yeah. it is under Linux. Somebody actually has to go up and run that code. Okay, and das in general, auch, ja. Linux are traditionally more advanced more likely to be afraid of threats and more likely to be considerate of what it is that they're running as opposed to somebody who has a Windows computer who's sitting there and they just really want to get into Club Penguin. Like, if that's their goal at that moment is to hit that Club Penguin, they're just going to double click. They're going to ABC all these people. Whereas with a Linux user, it's much
much less likely that they're going to sit there and look at something and go, oh yeah, this came from this company. Uh, and it definitely says clubpenguin.malware.exe.sa. I'm going to run that. You just have a different you have a different style. You have a different uh, type of person who runs Linux versus Windows. And I know that gets into like the whole, oh, I'm a Mac, I'm a so I'm a this, I'm a that. And, but in general, you will see people who run Windows are different than people who run Windows. And so that is another major part. And then in addition to that, there are less people who are creating viruses and creating malware for Linux than they are for Windows because of market share. If I can get Yay, 55 mention. million children to double click on that EXE file, and I infect 25% of them, and now I have access to their parents' banking account information in Windows, that's much more lucrative to me than infecting maybe 10 or 15 Linux administrators. So the, the marketplace is different for Windows and Linux and the infection. So there is a whole bunch of reasons a whole bunch of them are well cited and there's a lot of arguments about it, but in general it's just one type of person and the way that they use a computer versus another type of person and the way they use a computer. So Pharrell 7 and CentOS 7, I think it's new, so during the installation pro process in Anaconda, you can select security profiles. So you can actually set up, for example, a server that's going to be PCI compliant very start. Yeah. And that's all part of like the SE Linux. Uh, it really doesn't have anything to do with SE Linux. It will set up the the initial file system in such a way that it's going to be compliant with that standard. Huh, that's interesting. There's about a half dozen selections you can make during the process. Uh, for example, Red Hat corporate certified server. Kind of thing. So I've only had a topic for one of these evenings, right? Sure. I've only had to deal with PCI compliance a few times when I was, when I was working for another company, so before I went into what I'm doing right now. And I find it interesting that when I pick up the phone and call the folks at the government with like, hey, I need like a full breakdown of what PCI compliance means for my company and what I'm trying to accomplish, they essentially said, I don't know, but if you screw up, we're going to come in and we're going to use it to punish your company. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily to you, like, defend the data in a specific way. We just want to know that you did stuff, and then if you did, then that's good enough for us. So I would love to see what their standards are. Yeah. Um, when you talked about retaliation from government officials, I guess based upon the harassment uh, cases where people are lying to us, could that, number one, how do they, you know, will not find and prosecute these people? But number two, um, as far as, do they do the same retaliation, say, if you post something on Facebook, say, like, for instance, I disagree with John McCain's policy on this, are there people that maybe, hypothetically speaking, John McCain would hire to investigate, you know, people that are giving him bad press on, say, Facebook or on social media and things like that? I don't have that example for you, and I can't say in name, but if you Google, Google. online, but I don't have any names and I don't have people for you right now. 
No, I'm not asking for names, but you're just saying that you don't. It is possible if, say, for instance, you share certain opinions or whatever, that there are groups that might want to share negative opinions uh, or negative things about you or things like that. Yeah, we'll find tons of examples. I guess the best example you could give him is the leaker, I suppose, NSA leaker, right? Many people don't think she's a leaker because before she leaked those NSA documents, she actually tweeted out her opinion about her current president. And so many things she did what she did in spite of our president, not because she viewed the, uh, her actions as an actual leaking event. That, I don't have a comment on yet. Also, uh, there's a company called uh, Cambridge Analytica, which is a multi-billion dollar company that has been used to weaponize social media to serve both political and corporate gains. So the threat is much bigger than the individuals and groups that 4chan want to act against you, but it is, uh, it is capitalist at this point. Well, Russia has a cyber team. Israel has one of the biggest cyber teams in the world and one of the most professional. And uh, three quarters of the Israeli cyber counterterrorism slash social media team is um, dedicated entirely to spreading pro-Semitic information online. Oh, so feather falling, das brauche ich. Ich fall über. Ja, okay, nur feather falling, very, aber. Very, ja, nee, ich fall so uh, viel immer runter, Leute. Very, very <coughs> laser light focus on making sure that people have a good opinion about Israel. And they will regularly post in threads and spend a lot of time on web pages like 4chan working that. And that's also well known because of the fact that if you. So, I'll get with you in just a second. If you are a person who is under the age of a certain specific age group in Israel, you have to do mandatory military service. If you go to specific schools in Israel, then you sort of get funneled into very specific places that you can go for training. And if you show an aptitude in computer hacking or in working with certain things, then you get funneled to very specific teams. And those very specific teams are well known for then funneling those people back out into companies and into businesses where they're hired very, very quickly because of their skill set. And that's all sort of well known in the, the information technology slash information security like group. Like once you get picked up by one of those units, if that unit is cybersecurity focused, Israel does have the world's largest cybersecurity focused like battle ready unit. If you get picked up by that group, you're almost guaranteed a job the minute you're done with your mandatory service. Well their skill set is very, very high, and their their missions that they do are very, very constant, and they get a lot of training and a lot of practice. And I'll leave it up to you to do your best best job to figure out how to do So, yes. <coughs> uh, a question for you and for everyone in the room. Uh, what can we, as knowledgeable people, do to get rid of this, it ain't broke, don't fix it attitude for patching and security updates. I'm glad. You have an opportunity with WannaCry to say, look, it can cost you billions. Yes. But what else can we do? I'd love to hear any ideas. So I'm going to, this is my show, I'm going to interrupt first. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Microsoft. Anybody here go to the Microsoft store over here at the Fashion Center? You know they have classes constantly, cool classes, good classes that start all the way from little, little knee-high kids, where you can come in and you can learn about Minecraft. Did you know Apple? Alter, is this jetzt hier Dauerthema oder was? You can go in there every single day to the Apple Store and you can learn something. I go to the Apple Store constantly. Why? Because I'm taking classes. I take three classes on art, on music. I like to play video games, so I make little video games and I do all of this stuff. It's all 100% free. And I was sitting there and I was thinking to myself, like, I'm in enemy territory. I'm 100% undercover. I got my iPad. I'm in here learning how to make chip tunes with some dude who's like super pro Mac. And, every, and, I'm, and I'm just a Linux guy. And I thought to myself, where is the Linux store that I can send people to? And then after a few minutes, I realized, oh, I'm the Linux dude. I have to go out and I have to teach people. And guess what? Every single person in this room, you're the Linux person. You have your circle of friends, you have your circle of contacts, you have all of the people that you can teach, that you can train, you can come here and you can do talks, 
we're constantly looking for people to contribute. You can ask, hey, can we do like a training thing? Do you know Linux stuff? Or if you want to share that stuff, please do. Because guess what? Windows is doing it, Mac is doing it, everybody's doing it, but not enough of us in the Linux community are doing it. And if we're not doing that, if we're not contributing to Linux in some way, and guess what? You don't have to be a coder. Now, not a single person in here has to write a line of C and go out there and contribute to the kernel. You can contribute in other ways. You can be the propaganda unit that says good things about Linux online. You can be all of those things. And that's what we have to do. We have to spread that information. Yes, what we do in our computer club, the senior, is try to convince our members that they should, they're not going to keep their life of any virus in your malware up to date. So get the hell off Windows. Sure. Yeah, updates. Exactly what you brought up. Nobody's going to do the updates. They're not going to stay up to date. So guess what? You're still going to have to do updates, but that's where we come in to help those people set up automated updates. You can get in there and you can create automated update profiles for your computer so that it just constantly stays up to date. Yes. I was wondering if there, there are, I heard, I think I used one time some Linux-based antivirus program. Is that advisable? There is a Linux-based antivirus, but it's more like wearing protection for your partner, not necessarily for you. Okay? It's ClamApp. You can use ClamApp and there's other tools where you can search for Windows-related viruses that are coming in through your network. I have family members who use Windows. I have people in my family who have Windows computers. So guess what? Anything that's coming through my network is getting hit by a box to check to make sure that whatever it is that they're doing is safe. You can do the exact same thing. You can search for viruses. You can run things through Clam Apps. You can run Swift Proxy. Everybody here has a special skill set that allows you to do things that other people would be considering magic. But we can do all of that stuff, and it starts in your own home. That's where it all begins. Do you have a question? Or are you just stretching? Oh, yeah, sure. I, I want it. Uh, in relation to Watercraft, we have to remember it was a re-weaponized weapon. Yep. So it was an NSA tool to keep leverage against now ourselves. And you have the same thing with the CIA's Bolt 7, right? So all the big guys who had cyber squads in the U.S., they've all lost their tools. And they're all going to come back and buy it. Yeah. back in the butt. So... And in relate, now you can get into should the government harbor zero days or should they not? Well, they're allowed to hold zero days for at least two years before they have to report it. And if you trace that to when Microsoft actually released the patches, the NSA held out for the longest period of time before they realized we need to let Microsoft know so they can make a fix. So, I mean, whether we just broke, don't fix it, what we do, etc., etc. I think there's more more than just the people and our users, and more should our government be paying corporations like Microsoft or Apple or whoever they might be to actually put this in software. Not even that, they're actually starting to get it to, to open source, and they're actually paying their analysts to review open source code for potential vulnerabilities. And then they put it all in their fusion center, they do the same type of stuff, and they develop all the Thank you. I would say that 99% of that is accurate, but there's one thing that you're missing, and then we're going to shut it down. And the one thing that you're missing is that there are open source projects who have stated that they have had malicious code that they're inserting into their project purposely or been paid to do so. So keep that in mind. It's not just review of code, it is the creation of code. But I also got told I talked too much. So it is time for us to shut it down. So thank you very much. <lacht> Dieses Ende ist mir zu langsam schwarz. Und dann <lacht> Geil. Ähm, ja, haben wir wieder mal wieder. Äh, enjoyed it a lot. Aaron Jones, danke für diese Vorträge. Und ich vermute, du kannst kein Deutsch und äh, hörst mir sowieso nicht zu. Aber, äh, lol. Ähm, ja, also, <lacht> wir sind hier auf äh, Leso, dem Minecraft Anarchie Server ohne Regeln. Free to join, free to do whatever you want. Und ich bin irgendwie angesteckt von diesem Englisch und rede Englisch. Ähm, ja, genau. Also, <lacht> kommt ihr her, macht was ihr wollt und ähm, spielt auf diesem Server.
Äh, IP-Adresse ist 149.202.17.134. Alternativ gibt es auch die Domain sedihuni.com, auf die ihr beitreten könnt. Beides ist natürlich auch in der Beschreibung. Und ähm, falls sich die IP ändert, schaut am besten mal auf diesem Kanal hier auf eines der neueren Videos und ähm, schaut, ob sich da irgendwas verändert hat. <lacht> okay, dann würde ich sagen, war es das für diese Episode der Dauerwerbesendung. Und wir sehen uns in der nächsten Folge wieder. Alles klar, ciao.